Chapter 5 Leon ran the boat ashore on a sandbank. He switched off the motor and leaped out. Stay here, please, he said. I'll see what the problem is. Juan rushed forward and spoke urgently to Leon in Spanish. Jody couldn't understand a word of it. She looked at Brittany, who was listening with her head cocked. Do you know what he's saying, she asked. Brittany nodded. I think so. She said, it's about a bottle. He says he's, it's, a, it's in big trouble. Leon came striding back to the boat and spoke to Craig urgently. Please, could you look after the boat for me? Juan has found a dolphin trapped in a fishing net. I'm going to try to free it. Do you need some help? Gina asked. Leon nodded. Yes, it could be useful to have someone else to help hold the animal still while I cut the net. I'll come with you then, Gina said, clambering out of the boat. Can we come too? asked Jimmy. No, Craig said firmly. You guys stay right here with me. I don't want you getting in Leon's way. Jody was ha also halfway over the side of the boat as he said that. She hesitated and looked anxiously at her father. She was desperate to help. She couldn't bear to wait behind where when there was a dolphin that needed help. Craig caught her eye and nodded his head slightly. Smiling her thanks, Jody jumped down and ran after her mother and Leon. Jody was puzzled because they seemed to be moving away from the river. However, after a few moments, <clears throat> She saw that they were heading toward a sort of shallow canal that curved around to meet the river slightly farther down. Juan found the bottle, bottle about half an hour ago, tangled in a fishing net, he explained. He's been trying to untangle it, but couldn't do it. He doesn't have a knife or anything to cut through the net. He was just heading back to his village to get help when he spotted us. Will the bottle be all right? Jody asked anxiously. Fortunately, the water is shallow, so it is able to breathe, Leon told her, but we have no idea how long it has been caught or if it is badly injured, he concluded grimly. Jody's heart hammered in her chest. Let's hope we're not too late, said Gina quietly. Up ahead, Juan was beckoning to them. They hurried to join him. He was standing in the channel where the water came barely to his waist, and his arms were around the long grayish pink body of a bado. It lay still, without struggling, as if it knew the boy wanted to help. Jody could see its blowhole opening and closing like a tiny mouth as it breathed. Why, it's Ocho, Leon exclaimed, recognizing the dolphin. To Gina and Jody, he explained, I've known this one since he was born. He is still very young, just over a year old. He slipped down into the water beside Juan and stroked the trapped bottle, running a keen eye over his body. In a gentle voice, he murmured, you should have stayed close to your mama, not come so far chasing fishes. What do you want us to do? Jody asked. Get ready to help Juan gently hold Ocho still in case he starts to struggle while I'm cutting the net. Leon replied, he seems calm now, but he could just be exhausted. You never know. Be very calm yourself and try not to add to his stress. Jody got into the water beside Juan. She moved slowly carefully, keeping an anxious eye on Ocho. She wondered how long the bottle had been trapped before Juan found him. Lying in such shallow water meant he was able to breathe, but also meant he'd been exposed to the sun and the full heat of the day, and she knew that could be dangerous. As Leon got out his knife, Juan looked anxious. He spoke urgently in Spanish. Leon replied briefly and bent over the net. Taking great care to avoid damaging the dolphin's tender skin, he made a few cuts in the netting. Within seconds, the net fell from the dolphin's sides. Ocho was free. But the dolphin remained unmoving in the shallow, muddy water. Joey chewed her lip anxiously as she waited for Ocho to swim away. Was he injured? Had they arrived too late? She moved back in case the dolphin was afraid of her noticing that her mother and Juan were doing the same. Suddenly, Ocho gave a wheezing snort and rolled onto his side. His powerful flippers, so much bigger than the ones on the dolphins she'd been used to, flexed. He pushed himself away from the shore. Then he gave an awkward-looking leap that ended with a belly flop and splashed them all with water. Jody barely flinched. She was concentrating too hard on what the boro would do next. Was he injured at all? 
With a powerful flex of his tail, Ocho shot away down the narrow, shallow channel, heading for the river. She gave a deep sigh of relief. She really felt like cheering. Back to find his mama now, I hope, said Leon, smiling. We'll look for him tomorrow morning and make sure he's not suffering any bad effects. Reaching to give Gina a hand and climbing out of the channel, he added, Juan, would you like a lift with us to the research station? He repeated his offer to the boy in Spanish. Juan nodded. Si, si, con muchas gracias, he accepted politely, but he was staring worriedly at the slashed net. He said something else to Leon in Spanish, and the man replied. What are they talking about? Jody asked her mother in a whisper. Juan says the man who owns the slash net can't afford to buy a new one, Gina explained as she listened to the conversation. Jody frowned. Well, he shouldn't have said it. Where a dolphin could get trapped in it, she said hotly. It serves him right. <clears throat> Gina shook her head, although she looked sympathetic. Life isn't that simple, sweetheart. The local people need two fish to survive, just as much as the dolphins do. But I think it would be all right this time, she added, pausing to listen to Leon's reply to Juan. Jody saw that Juan looked very relieved and was nodding eagerly. What did Leon say, she asked. I think somebody needs to work a little harder on her Spanish, Gina said teasingly. Then she relented and translated. Leon says that his organization will pay for a new net this time. But he says Juan must remind the local fishermen not to set their nets in these narrow channels where it is too hard for the dolphins to avoid them in the dry season, Gina explained. He says, tell them to remember the discussions they've had about safer ways of using nets, she finished. That settled, they all walked back down to the river and rejoined the others on board Tonina. Leon pushed the boat back into the river, jumped aboard and started up the engine. Then he introduced Juan to everyone. I first met Juan a couple of years ago during a visit to his school, he explained. Part of our work at the research station is to help local people figure out the best ways of preserving the environment. So we make regular visits to the village school. Juan was absolutely fascinated by Bottos even before we came. But once he learned about our research, well, there was no stopping him. Leon grinned and looked to Juan for agreement. But Juan didn't notice. He was staring awestruck at Brittany. Jody realized he had not taken his eyes off her since he arrived. He couldn't tell if Brittany was aware of his interest or not. She wore a faintly bored expression on her face as she gazed out at the passing scenery. She could have been miles away or only pretending not to notice. When Juan did not respond to Leon, Craig jumped in to fill the pause. So does Juan spend all his time rescuing dolphins in need, he asked with a friendly grin. He spends most of his spare time helping us at the research station, Leon replied. Isn't that right, Juan? Juan did not reply. He was edging along the bench, inching closer to Brittany. Very slowly, as if approaching a timid animal, he stretched out one hand to touch her long, fair hair. Brittany flinched and pulled back, glaring at him. Juan looked sorry. Lo siento mucho, he murmured in apology. Por favor. Jody expected Brittany to tell him off in no uncertain terms, but the girl hesitated, and when she spoke, her voice was unexpectedly gentle. The other surprise was that she spoke in Spanish. Juan gasped, his eyes widening in astonishment that this stranger spoke his own language. He responded with a torrent of rapid Spanish. Brittany giggled. She shook her head. Then, in her slow, careful Spanish, she begged him to slow down. She explained that she had been studying Spanish for only a year. Then I'll speak in English, Juan announced, because I have been studying your language for two whole years, ever since meeting Leon and Carlos and Julie. Most of the people who come to the research station speak English. Carlos, he comes from Caracas. He says English is the international language of business and science. I want to be a scientist, so I should know English. You understand? He gazed at her, dazzled. But I am very surprised that you speak Spanish. That is amazing. Brittany shrugged. They made us study it at my school, that's all. She looked away from his adoring gaze, obviously uncomfortable. Hey, Leon, she called. How much farther do we have to go? Not long now, he promised. Within a few minutes, they arrived at an intersection with another river. Jody glimpsed a flash of pink and gray. 
Moments later, there was a sight of a broad, powerful flipper as another bottle reached in the water, rolled in the water. Another one popped up, its long, snouted face seeming to give them a mischievous grin before disappearing. Again, everywhere they looked, there were splashings and snortings and brief magical glimpses of the big, long-snouted pink and gray creatures. The bottles often gather where two reavers intersect, Leon explained, as Gina grabbed her camera and began snapping away. It is a good place for them to fish. So, of course, he added, it also makes a good place for a research station. And here it is. Rounding the bend, they saw it, a big wooden house on stilts overlooking the river. There's a lake on the other side, Leon explained, steering the boat to a jetty and stopping the engine. Right now, the house is on dry land, but during the high water season, for about three months, only those tall stilts keep it safely above the water. Then, when the river and lake's waters actually meet, we can take the boat right up to the front door. But we're in the river's falling season now, he reminded them, leaping out onto the jetty. He tied the boat securely to a post with a rope that was fastened there, and then turned his warm smile to his passengers. Come with me and meet the others. They followed him up a wooden staircase and into a casually cluttered living room office area. It was furnished with a couch and several wicker chairs and two computer workstations. A dark, handsome man with a neatly trim beard was seated in front of one of the computers. He got to his feet as they entered. Leon introduced him to everyone as Dr. Carlos Benavides. We read your study of the social life of Boros, Greg, Craig said, shaking, Carlos's firmly, shaking Carlos firmly by the hand. Wonderful work. Thank you, said the Venezuelan science, replying with a warm smile. I, myself, have enjoyed following your travels via the Dolphin Universe website. I feel as if we are friends already. Come along. We can talk in the kitchen, Leon urged. I'm dying for a cup of coffee. Oh, me too, Gina explained. And me, said Dr. Taylor, perking up a little. He mopped his perspiring face with a large handkerchief. Jody didn't care about coffee, but she followed the others to the kitchen. This is our resident researcher, Leon said as he entered the lodge room, Julie Baker, who came here all the way from England two years ago to study the bottle. Julie was a young woman who wore a pair of gold rim glasses. Her brown hair was cut into neat, short bob that framed her attractive, round-faced features. She turned away from the stove to greet them. How was your journey, she asked after introductions had been made. Her eyes fell on Juan and she grinned. I see you picked up another passenger along the way. We had to rescue Ocho from a net, Juan told her. Her face clouded. Is he all right? She asked anxiously. Last seen swimming off at top speed to find his mama, Leon replied, smiling. Julie gave a sigh of relief. She turned back to the stove and plucked something from a simmering pot. Surprised, Jody saw that she held a very large baby's bottle. Julie tested the temperature of the milk by shaking a few drops on her wrist. She nodded in satisfaction. Well, I'm off to nurse the baby, she said. Anybody want to come? I do, said Juan. His eagerness made Jody suspicious. What kind of baby is it? She asked. Julie smiled mysteriously. It's a little boy, manatee. She drawled, then laughed at the looks on the faces. A manatee, Sean exclaimed. You mean a sea cow? We've got them in Florida, Jimmy piped up. Julie nodded. Yes, I know, but the South American manatee is much smaller than its relatives in Florida. What happened to its mother? Brittany asked, frowning with concern. Killed by a hunter, Wanick told her. Jody gasped in horror. Aren't manatees protected here? She asked. In Florida, she knew the manatee was an endangered species. There's supposed to be a ban on hunting them, Julie explained, but it's hard to enforce. They're supposed to be delicious, and of course, the local people don't get many chances to eat meat. At least, least we've managed to save this one, Juan said. Jody looked at him, surprised and respectful. Did you save him? Not me, myself, he said quickly, looking embarrassed at the misunderstanding. It was an American researcher named Buddy Watkins who found the manatee calf, Julie explained. Juan was here when the calf was brought in, and he's been an enormous help. Juan shrugged shyly as the young Englishwoman turned a dazzling smile on him. 
We named the little calf Buddy after his rescuer. Julie went on. Buddy Watkins did more than just find him. He also donated nearly $2,000 to build a special concrete tank so we can keep little Buddy safe and look after him until he grows up. She moved toward the door. But that's enough talk. Buddy wants his milk. Come and meet him yourselves. 